All right, we are in chapter seven, which is all about market structures. Um, there are three sections in chapter seven. First, we're going to talk about perfect competition and monopoly. Then we'll get into monopolistic competition and oligopoly. And then we'll finish off with antitrust regulation and competition. So first of all, perfect competition and monopoly. Um, we're going to identify the features of perfect competition, describe the barriers to entry that can create a monopoly, and then compare the market structures of monopoly and perfect competition in terms of price and quantity. So first of all, perfect competition. Um, the term market structure describes the important characteristics or features of a market. Um, the first market structure we're going to talk about is perfect competition. In perfect competition, perfectly competitive markets are assumed to have um, the following four features. First of all, there are buyers and seller. There are many buyers and sellers, so many that each buys or sells only a tiny fraction of the total market output. This assumption ensures that no individual buyer or seller can influence the price. Secondly, firms produce a standardized product or a commodity. Um, a commodity is a product that is identical across suppliers, such as a bushel of wheat, a bushel of corn, or a share of Google stock. Because all suppliers, are, because all suppliers offer an identical product, no buyer is willing to pay more for one particular supplier's product. The third characteristic is buyers are fully informed about the price, quality, and availability of the products, and sellers are fully informed about the availability of all resources and technology. The fourth um, characteristic is firms can easily enter or leave the market industry. There are no obstacles preventing new firms from entering profitable markets or preventing existing firms from leaving unprofitable markets. If we look up here, um, these are the questions that can be asked or these are the market features for all the markets we're going to talk about in this chapter. And then um, this is what we just went through when talking about perfect competition. So for perfect competition, there are many buyers and sellers. Um, product uniformity, um, it's a standardized product, okay? It's very easy to enter and leave the market. And then forms of competition, do they compete based on prices, etc. So these are the four questions that we ask to talk about any market um, in this chapter. So an example of a perfectly competitive market, it would include markets for shares of large corporations such as Google or General Electric or Walmart, etc. Um, another example is markets for foreign exchange, meaning um, the dollars that are used in exchange in other countries, the yen, euros, and pounds. It would also include markets for most agricultural products, livestock, corn, wheat, and we'll talk about milk later on. There are so many buyers and sellers that the action of any one cannot influence the market price. Thousands of wheat farmers in Kansas together grow less than 3% of the world's supply of wheat. Therefore, no single wheat farmer can influence the market price of wheat. Um, any profit in this market attracts new firms in the long run, which increases the market supply. This reduces the market price. The lower price drives down the profit in the market. Um, so in market price, um, once market price is established, each farmer can sell however much he or she wants to sell at that market price. So if we talk about farms, um, each farm is so small relative to the market that each has no impact on the market price. All farmers produce identical products, and any farmer who charges more than the market price sells no wheat. Um, if we go back to this slide, it says that thousands of wheat farmers in Kansas alone um, grow less than 3% of the world's supply of wheat. So I think it's safe to say 
that even if the state of Kansas decided to sell their wheat at a different price, they wouldn't sell it. Okay, they're not big enough to influence the market. Um, and then each individual farm is even smaller, so they won't be able to influence the market price either. Okay, second bullet point here, it says farms are free to charge less than the market price, but why would, we, why would they do that? Okay, if every farm in the world is selling their, their wheat for a certain price, why would you decide to get less for it when, um, if the market price is set, then that's what everybody is buying the wheat at. The demand curve facing an individual farmer is a horizontal line drawn at the market price because in perfect competition there is no competition. So if we look at this bullet point right here, the demand curve facing an individual farmer is a horizontal line drawn at market price. That's right here. So the price per bushel is $5, no matter how many bushels of wheat per day you sell. If you sold 10 bushels of wheat, Sorry about that. You're going to get $5. If you sell 15 bushels of wheat, you're going to get $5. So the demand curve is horizontal. Um, if we look at supply and demand, okay, this is where equilibrium is. $5, you're going to sell 1,200,000 bushels of wheat per day. That's market equilibrium. But the firm's demand um, is a different curve. Okay, what do we see here? I see three identical apples. They all look exactly the same. Um, the apples are indistinguishable. They're the same shape, the same color, the same size. Um, imagine that you're hungry and you want to buy one of the apples. Um, do you care where the apples are grown? Not really. They're all the same. Each apple came from a different farmer, and there are at least 100 other similar apples that you could buy from other farmers at a local market. How would you choose among the apples? Well, I would choose the apple that's the lowest price. Um, they're all the same, so what does it matter? You're going to buy the cheapest one. That demonstrates perfect competition. Because consumers see no difference among the products, they care only about the price they choose which apple, when they choose which apple to buy. Um, what would happen to an indiv individual farmer who attempted to charge more for apples than other farmers? Well, you're not going to buy it. No one's going to buy from a farmer that charges more for the apple because the apple can be purchased for a cheaper price. <clears throat> All right, let's move on to monopoly. Um, monopoly, the sole supplier of a product with no close substitutes. And market power is the ability of a firm to raise its price without losing all sales to rivals. Those are our two vocabulary words to start out with. So, hold on a second. If we go back here to, wow, oh, where'd it go? The questions. Sorry, I've lost them. Ah. Sorry trying to zoom out and it's not letting me. Um, if we go, there we go. If we get to, now we'll go here, um, these questions. Okay, we're going to ask these questions again for Monopoly. So let's get to Monopoly. Might take a second. Three apples. So we're going to ask these questions again and right here. Barriers to entry. Um, a monopolized market has high barriers to entry. That means that um, restrictions on the entry of new firms to an industry. <coughs> barriers to entry allow a monopolist to change a price above the competitive price. If other firms could easily enter the market, they would increase the market supply and thereby drive the price down to the competitive level. There are three types of entry barriers. There are legal restrictions, economies of scale, and control of an essential resource. The first one, legal restrictions. That just means governments can prevent new firms from entering a market by making entry illegal. 
Um, that can be done through patents, licenses, and other legal restrictions. Um, governments in some cities confer monopoly rights to sell hot dogs at civic auditoriums, um, collect garbage, offer bus and, and taxi service, and supply other services ranging from electricity to cable TV. The government itself may become a, a monopolist by supplying the product and outlawing competition. For example, many states are monopoly sellers of liquor and lottery tickets, and the U.S. Postal Service has the exclusive right to deliver first-class mail. Um, so those would be the legal restrictions, which is a barrier to entry. Um, economies of scale. If you remember back a few chapters, we learned that economies of scale, that is um, forces that reduce a firm's average cost as the firm's size or scale increases in the long run. So um, economies of scale, a single firm can sometimes satisfy market demand at a lower average cost per unit than could two or more smaller firms. Um, so joining together and having one larger firm, things can be less expensive. Um, it's interesting to point out natural monopolies and geographic monopolies. Um, for example, the transmission of electricity involves economies of scale. One wire, once wires are run throughout a community, the cost of linking additional households to the power grid is relatively small. The cost per household declines as more and more households are wired into the system. This would be called a natural monopoly. Um, a new entrant cannot sell enough output to experience the economies of scale. So entry into the market is naturally blocked. That would be the natural monopoly. Entry into the market is naturally blocked. The geographic monopolies, an example would be in less populated areas, natural monopolies include only one grocery store, just one movie theater, or restaurants for miles around. Um, that would be a geographic monopoly for products sold in local markets. If there's only one in a very small town, it's a geographic monopoly. Um, oh, sorry, we forgot the essential resources. Um, sometimes the source of monopoly power is a firm's control over some resources critical to production. Um, for a funny example would be China is a monopoly supplier of pandas to the world's zoo. The National Zoo, the National zoo in D.C., for example, rents a pair of pandas from China for $1 million per year. As a way of controlling the panda supply, China stipulates that any offspring from the Washington pair becomes China's property. Other zoos have similar deals with China. Another um, essential resource example would be professional sports teams and their large stadiums. Pro teams typically sign exclusive long-term leases for stadiums in major cities. These leases help block the formation of another league in the sport. Hey, monopolists may not even earn a profit. Um, because a monopoly by definition supplies the entire market, the demand curve for monopolist output is also the demand, the market demand curve. Um, even a monopolist with ironclad barriers to entry may grow, go broke. Although a monopolist is the sole supplier of a good with no close substitutes, the demand for that good may not be great enough to keep the firm in business. Um, some examples are inventions that are protected from direct competition by patents, yet most patented products, patented products never get produced, and many that are produced fail to attract enough com customers to survive. Um, just means that not every monopoly is going to make money and not every product that gets patented will make it to market. True monopolies are actually very rare. Long-lasting monopolies are rare because a profitable monopoly attracts competitors and substitutes. Um, for example, the rail industry was a true monopoly until the trucking industry was born. Um, Long-distance telephones were a true monopoly until wireless was developed. Likewise, fax machines, email, and the Internet 
text messaging and delivery firms such as FedEx and UPS have all cut into the U.S. Postal Service's monopoly on first-class mail delivery. Now we see a single apple. Um, okay, the single apple, uh, if we look at it, we have one producer of apples in the world. Okay? Um, how much could the owner of this apple charge? If you think about that for a second, you would say they could charge whatever they want. It's the only apple in the world. Um, so if you really want that apple, you're probably going to be willing to spend a lot of money for that apple. Um, so above some price, no one's actually going to want to buy it, and the owner will receive no revenue because the apple will not be sold. That would be the example of some firms don't make money, some monopolies. Other firms with monopoly power face that same limitation as the owner of the apple that may charge too much money and nobody buys it. Um, another monopoly example, um, here we have a picture of the Super Bowl. So if you are desperate to, desperate to attend the Super Bowl, your favorite team is playing, and you're willing to pay almost any price to attend the sold-out game. Two days before the game, um, I tell everybody, hey, I have a ticket and I'm willing to sell it for $500. Will you pay $500 for the ticket? And if you do, why? Um, if you decide not to buy the ticket, will I still be able to sell that ticket to somebody else? Okay, that's an example of a monopoly of like the Super Bowl and who has the monopoly power. Um, in that example, I do because I have a ticket that I'm willing to sell. Um, above me, the Super Bowl is the monopoly because it's the only Super Bowl once a year in the world. Um, there are no close substitutes for the Super Bowl. And even if you decide not to buy the ticket, I don't think I'll have a problem selling it to anyone else for $500. Hey, learning objective three, um, monopoly and efficiency. Monopolies are not guaranteed a profit. Monopolies can lose money, and monopolies are relatively rare. So to start out, monopoly versus perfect competition. Competition forces firms to be efficient, that is, to produce the maximum possible output at the lowest possible price. Um, successful monopolists typically, typically charge more than competitive firms do. Fewer customers can afford the product. And um, what if one firm buys up all the individual firms in the perfectly competitive market, creating a giant monopoly? The market demand curve becomes the monopolist demand curve. Suppose the average cost per unit is the same with monopoly as with per perfect competition. What we can say for sure is that a monopoly supplies less output at a higher price than would a perfectly competitive market. To maximize profit, the monopolist restricts quantity and increases the price. With monopoly, consumer surplus shrinks um, because the monopoly is not producing as much product. Other problems with monopolies. They may reduce social welfare for other reasons besides higher prices to customers. These include a possible waste of resources and inefficiencies that may develop in their operation. Um, resources wasted. So monopolies may have too much influence on the political system, which they use to protect and strengthen their monopoly power. Um, lawyers' fees, lobbying expenses, and other costs associated with gaining a special privilege from government are largely a social waste because they use up scarce resources, but they don't add anything to the output. Let me get an example there. And there isn't a good one. Monopolies may grow inefficient. Um, the monopolist, which is insulated from the rigors of market competition, 
could very easily grow fat and lazy and therefore becoming inefficient. Um, executives could waste resources by creating a more comfortable life for themselves and not sharing profit with the workers or the stockholders. Lavish salaries and company perks could boost the average cost of production above the competitive level. Um, that means they're charging too much for the product to line their pockets with money um, and their production is no longer competitive. Monopolists also have been criticized for being slow to adopt the latest production techniques, re reluctant to develop new products, and generally lacking in innovation. Okay, we learned that competition is good. Competition keeps everybody sharp, keeps prices down, keeps innovation going. Um, monopolies, they can often be inefficient because there's nothing pushing them to do better, to produce more efficiently, to charge lower prices. Why monopolies might not be so bad. For several reasons, some monopolies may not be as socially wasteful as was just described. First of all, economies of scale. If economies of scale are substantial, a monopolist might be able to produce output at a lower average cost than competitive firms could. Therefore, the price, or at least the cost of production, could be lower with monopoly than with perfect competition. Government regulations. Um, government intervention can increase social welfare by forcing the monopolist to lower the price and increase output. Um, this would be an example of subways or bus systems that will help if prices are kept low it will help social welfare. Um, the government can either operate the monopoly itself as it does with most urban transit systems or it can regulate a privately owned monopoly as it does with local telephone services and electricity transmission. Um, keeping prices low to avoid regulation a monopolist might keep prices below the profit maximizing level to avoid government regulation. Basically to keep themselves off the radar. You know, if they make too much money, they will attract attention by the government. Prices and profits of drug companies, which individually are monopoly suppliers of patented medicines, they come under scrutiny from time to time by public officials who threaten to regulate the drug prices. Okay, if, if they're making too much money, they're drawing attention to themselves and they'll come under scrutiny to public officials and they threaten to make them regulate their prices and bring them down. Drug firms might try to avoid such treatment by keeping prices below the level that would maximize profit. Keeping prices low to prevent competition. Um, a monopolist, it's very similar to the last slide. Um, a monopolist might keep the price below the profit maximizing level to avoid attracting competitors. Basically, they don't want to attract anybody. They don't want to draw attention to themselves at all. For example, at one time Alcoa was the only U.S. producer of aluminum. Industry observers claimed that the company kept prices and profits below their maximum to discourage the entry of new firms. Okay, our example here is this awesome golf cart. So the world's only golf cart producer has trouble keeping up with demand from golf courses that are willing to pay $5,000 per cart. The firm's workers are already well paid, but they are demanding a 10% raise, more vacation time, and a longer lunch period in their labor, neg in their labor no negotiations. If the firm ref refuses to grant these demands, there may be a strike that could interrupt production for weeks or even months. So how would you guys respond to the workers' demands? How would you respond um, if there were 50 other golf cart manufacturers out there? Okay, so if that's the only golf cart manufacturer and those workers are demanding um, those items and you can't keep up with demand already, Chances are you could probably charge more for your golf cart and let the workers benefit from the increased revenue. Um, if there are 50 other golf cart manufacturers, you're not going to be able to do much because if you increase your prices, the golf courses will just purchase the golf carts from other golf cart manufacturers. 
Um, so that's the difference between, you know, monopoly and competition. So he would agree, he would probably agree to the workers' demands to avoid a strike and then pass the increased co cost on to customers. Um, but you would probably refuse the demands if you were one of 50 producers because it would be difficult to pass on the added cost because it's competitive. And that is it.